The old man coughed, the sound wet and rattling, like a sack of stones dumped on the cobblestones. It wouldn't be long now. Death clung to him, a sickly sweet rot that filled the air. There was nothing more I could do for him, not with herbs or salves. That's not why I was here, of course. They call me an apprentice, but I'm no healer. My master, his work lies beyond cures of the flesh. His touch lingers on those ready to pass, easing their souls out and, well, let's just say the dying aren't his final patients. I didn't understand back then, not fully, that's why he kept me around, I imagine. A clean slate to mould. Another cough, rasping, pained. One eye opened slightly, milky and clouded over. I didn't lean in. You never knew what kind of shadows might be writhing inside a person at the end, and what could try to hitch a ride out with the soul. My master told me horror stories, enough to make the bravest lad wet himself. Th thirsty, the old man whispered, his lips barely moving. I didn't give him water. You learn some things the hard way. A final plea, perhaps, in a life full of many that went unanswered. His breathing hitched, and I tensed. This was it. As the last rattling exhale left his body, my master slid out of the shadows like a viper. Even though I'd seen it countless times, it still made my insides clench. His presence was wrong, out of sync with the flow of the world. I didn't see how someone could walk like that and still call themselves human. With a flick of his wrist, my master summoned, well, not a tool exactly. Pure darkness, it seemed, twisted into a tendril reaching towards the man. That tendril snaked around what I could only call a shimmer above the body, pulling, like reeling in a miserable silent catch. A hint of defiance sparked in the old man's eyes, not in his body that was slack and dead, but in whatever this was my master was hauling on. Then it gave in with a sound like tearing cloth, and a wisp of smoke rose from the corpse. An echo of a scream hit my ears, faint but chilling. The smoke coalesced around the darkness my master commanded. An inky sphere, streaked with silver and twitching with something sinister, hung suspended in the room. He tilted his head, studying it as a connoisseur might assess a prize vintage. Greedy old bastard, he murmured, more to himself than me. His hand closed around the orb and it vanished in a blink. Then he turned a pale, dispassionate gaze on me. Come, boy. Another village. More work to be done. Tonight, we feast. The last word he didn't speak aloud, but I heard it all the same. That old familiar nausea clawed at me, but worse was the jolt of excitement and of fear. It was always that way, the push and pull. I followed him into the night, because what other choice did I have? We left the hovel at a brisk pace, the only illumination the meager sliver of moon hanging low in the night sky. I hated these village jaunts. Cities, that was where we usually lurked. Enough death there that an extra soul or two barely caused a ripple, and plenty of shadowed corners to do. Well, whatever my master did with those wretched little orbs. Villages, though, it was different. Everyone noticed everyone. An outsider like my master, he stood out like a sore thumb. If we lingered too long, they'd get pitchforks and torches, or worse, that travelling priest with the shiny sword and the righteous gleam in his eyes. I shuddered. That particular zealot wouldn't give two figs what my master was, or wasn't. He'd try to smite us both on principle. As if reading my mind, my master spoke his voice a mere hiss barely louder than the rustling leaves. You worry too much, boy. Fear's like blood in the water. It draws attention you don't want. The rebuke stung, but I kept silent. No point in arguing. If there was one thing my master wasn't, it was wrong. But that didn't stop the dread tightening in my gut. Several paces behind, an owl hooted low and mournful. Bad sign, I muttered, more to myself than him. Or... My master replied, that hint of a mocking smile in his otherwise cold voice. Dinner just announced itself. I shivered. 
we trudged into the forest, the usual path long since worn bare by our passing. Up ahead, the clearing beckoned, bathed in that cold moonlight. It was time for my part of the work. It always was. Gripping the rough leather pouch at my waist, I pulled out a handful of powder, a mix of crushed herbs and cemetery dirt, foul in more ways than one. As I reached the clearing's heart, I began scattering it in a wide circle, my movements sure and practiced. With every handful, a faint silver shimmer coalesced in the air, tracing the circle, a barrier of sorts. Imperfect, but more than enough to keep most unwelcome things at bay. In the center of the circle, I placed the bait, a lump of raw meat already stinking to high heaven. The smell made my stomach churn, but it was what drew them in. That and the whispered words I didn't quite believe in. A chant the master had forced into my head like a blacksmith might drive a nail. Waiting was agony. Time seemed to slow, every rustle in the underbrush making me jump. The forest here wasn't natural. It quivered with a wrongness, an echo of all the dark deeds performed in this clearing. Then, there, a flash of translucent light winked out of the shadows. Something had crossed the barrier. Master, I called softly, not out of fear, but habit. His reply was immediate, a rustle of movement before he materialized beside me, the unnaturalness of his presence even more jarring against the twisting trees. We crouched side by side and my breath caught. An old woman floated toward the meat, hunched and wraith-like. Her eyes, open too wide, held a milky haze of confusion. But my master didn't even glance her way. Not pure, he hissed, tainted by spite, useless. She drifted onward, oblivious to us, leaving the circle. Disappointment flooded me. Another wasted night, another fruitless wait. Then another movement, something slithering low against the ground. Its shape writhed in the shadows, but the eyes, two burning coals, fixated on the meat. This one my master watched, his gaze sharpening. Hungry, desperate, yes, this one will do, he hissed. My heart tripped in my chest. Each time it was always this moment, the choice, that left me with a taste of bile on my tongue. My master wasn't wrong. These things, whatever they were, they weren't the souls my master reaped. Lost fragments, warped and feral, fueled by some base, dark instinct. I tried not to think how close a person might be to that when death finally took them. Then the creature reached the meat. It lunged with terrifying speed and the forest erupted in a flash of movement and a screech like ice on glass. I flinched, even after all these nights. What I glimpsed was only a blur, clawed limbs, a distended skull wreathed in dripping shadow and that terrible hunger blazing in its burning eyes. My master moved faster. Before the creature could sink its teeth in, he was there. His dark coiled tendril lashed out and the creature howled, a sound full of both fury and a terrified despair that made my insides clench. Then he simply reached out and there was no other word for it. Unmade the creature. In a flash of darkness, it dissolved into tattered remnants of smoke before finally being consumed by the hungry soil. In the stillness that followed, my master simply watched the ground, expression unreadable. I knew this routine too. He needed a moment, something beyond what humans did after facing down monstrous predators. I swallowed back the fear and stayed absolutely still, a prey animal hoping not to draw the hunter's gaze. Finally, my master sighed, a low rattling sound that seemed to pull something chilling from the air. Gather this place, he ordered, the words cold and sharp as ever. I reached into my pouch again, this time for a small polished stone. Crouching, I pressed it to the spot where the creature had dissolved. The ground seemed to hum against my palm. With a jolt, my mind filled with fragments, not images, but a blast of raw sensation. Hunger. A gnawing desperation, a mindless need to take, and take, until nothing was left. It felt filthy, invasive. I pulled back, gasping, 
the taste of grit in my mouth, but within the stone that echo lingered, a sliver of dark power now bound and tamed. A decent harvest. My master spoke again, his voice less sharp but still unsettling. Let us return. He turned, vanishing into shadows deeper than mere nightfall could create. I scrambled to my feet, not looking back at the clearing. Something about that hunger, the echoing desperation. It left a cold knot in my belly every time. Was that what lay at the bottom of a person's heart when they reached their end? That's when a new fear struck me. What kind of echo might a monster like my master leave behind? This wasn't a life you slipped into and then found your way out of easily. The more I saw, the more I learned, the harder it seemed to imagine there was an out at all. We returned to my master's abode, a crumbling manor on the outskirts of the nearest town. It creaked with age and secrets, even more unsettling than his cold presence. My stomach churned, knowing there were rooms there I still hadn't been allowed to see. Rooms below, if the echoing chill emanating from the cellar door was anything to go by. Inside, he barely acknowledged me. With a flick of his wrist, both the glowing soul orb and the stone I carried disappeared from his grasp. I knew their destination. The locked room. My stomach twisted at the thought of that echoing space, filled with countless orbs throbbing with their trapped echoes of death. Why my master collected souls? Well, that I knew all too well, thanks to his infrequent bouts of cruel exposition. The stones, though, the fragments of... Whatever those beasts in the forest were, their purpose eluded me. And there was no use asking. All that would earn me was a dark look, or worse, another of his twisted lessons. He swept past me toward the library, his usual haunt. Prepare the vats, he tossed back carelessly, and dread flooded me. Those vats, with their foul reek and strange glow, that was where it happened. I don't know exactly what it was, only that after some nights he emerged. Different, more potent, yet the wrongness that clung to him was sharper. I did as commanded, not out of obedience anymore, but a kind of terrified self-preservation. Better to have my hands occupied than a mind wandering to dark speculation. The vats were already half-filled with an oily liquid, laced with ingredients whose names chilled me more than the drafts in the cellar. Dried nightshade, mandrake root, and stranger things. Slivers of a black rock my master brought back from his long sojourns into godforsaken corners of the world. As I stirred that noxious concoction, I remembered all too clearly the time I'd accidentally spilled a few drops on my skin. Pain like nothing I'd ever imagined, searing and bone deep, followed by a black emptiness I could hardly remember without screaming. The touch of his tendril had burned away the worst of it, but that sensation of hollow oblivion had stayed with me long after the scar had faded. Hours later, exhausted and my head filled with an awful buzzing, I retreated to my cot in the attic. Sleep wouldn't come. Not easily. Images swam in my head. That greedy old man in the cottage. The fading wisp of defiance, torn from his cooling corpse. The creature's desperate hunger twisting in the stone. Those lingered, but worse was the picture of my master, standing over the vats with the soul orb, the way his pale eyes gleamed with anticipation. In those stolen nights of fitful half-sleep, I imagined myself slipping away, running until I hit the edge of the world, until my master and his shadows were just foul memories. Then reality would jolt me awake. No money, no survival skills, no clue what lay beyond the small circle of life he'd forced me into, and always that whisper of fear. He would find me. He always did, if something caught his interest. Days blurred into a haze of gruelling routine. I cleaned, fetched supplies from the distrustful town folk, endured my master's cryptic lessons that raised more questions than they answered. Always the vats waited. It felt as if their noxious emanations seeped into the very walls of the manor, twisting them into echoes of the horrors they facilitated. My master grew more distant, locked in his own obsessions. 
The soul orbs glowed in the locked room, an unseen heartbeat in the crumbling house. And then, the inevitable night arrived. We feast, boy, he announced, his voice rasping through the gloom. My heart sank. These nights were the worst. His lessons shifted from arcane knowledge and strange philosophies to exhibitions. Each one left me sick and questioning, questioning what shreds of human decency might still be lingering inside me. He led me to the vats, and their luminescent glow painted the shadows in monstrous hues. With a sweep of his hand, he conjured the writhing soul orb from the locked room. It felt sickeningly alive, and I choked back bile. But worse was to come. From some hidden pocket, he produced one of the stones I'd harvested, a piece of that creature's desperate hunger. I understood enough now. There was a connection between the two, a perversion of nature and balance that even my master didn't fully grasp, only exploited. As if in response, the stone thrummed against my flesh. He commanded me to hold both, and dread filled me like freezing water. Then he placed one hand on my shoulder, and a surge of icy darkness flowed through me. My vision blurred, my limbs trembled, and it felt as if my very consciousness was being stretched thin across an immeasurable gulf. In the depths of the stone, I sensed the monstrous hunger twisting. The soul, instead of resisting, began to respond, not with anything resembling human cognition, but like a lock finally finding its key. Raw fear gave way to a morbid fascination. Through a haze, I heard my master's voice, laced with cold excitement he rarely displayed. Power attracts power, boy, like calls to like, this synergy, it will serve us well. The hunger in the stone warped and stretched, pulled towards the trapped soul. The orb dimmed, losing its luminescence as some unspeakable transfer took place. Then I sensed something break, shatter. Waves of pain, sharper than the nightshade burn, racked me. Everything grew blindingly bright and I blacked out. When I awoke, the vats were empty. The air felt cleaner, less oppressive despite my ragged breathing. There was no sign of soul or stone, just the echoes of my own ragged breathing. But most unsettling of all, my master was nowhere to be found. My head throbbed, a painful reminder of what had transpired. Fear gave way to a grim realization. My master was gone. Had he finally left me behind, no longer finding value in his apprentice? Or was this some test, one I'd failed, leaving whatever horrific punishment awaited when, no, if, he returned? With every creak of the old manor, I tensed, waiting for the whisper of his footsteps, the chill caress of his presence. Sleep became a battle against nightmarish visions of those glowing vats and the writhing darkness my master commanded. Each dawn brought a mix of relief that I'd survived another night and dread of what the day might bring. Finally, I knew I couldn't continue this way. If he weren't coming back, sitting trapped in this house was just a slower kind of death. I packed a few meager supplies and hesitated with my hand on the manor's weathered door. This had been my prison, but venturing out felt like stepping onto a tightrope strung over a chasm. Still, if there was the slightest chance for a different life, it lay on the other side. The town felt foreign despite its familiarity. My usual errands took me past bustling market squares and rowdy taverns, places where lives moved on their own clockwork schedules. The villagers eyed me with suspicion, murmuring among themselves. Was I marked by my proximity to my master, by the dark events that transpired in that crumbling manner? The thought sent shivers down my spine. A child darted into my path, her laughter like a distant echo. In the simple joy on her face, I saw the chasm between us, a chasm of choices and experiences I could barely comprehend. Had I ever possessed such carefree innocence? It seemed a lifetime ago, in a reality far removed from mine. I fled the town, instinct propelling me away from prying eyes, from questions I couldn't answer. 
The wilderness called, harsh and unforgiving, but at least there, the dangers were overt. Yet I also realized something within me clung to its lessons. For all my revulsion and fear, my master had taught me how to see, through the illusions of simple living, to the truths buzzing beneath the surface of the world. In a forest clearing, a stag raised its head, wary but unafraid. Its eyes held no malice, the hunger it embodied honest and pure. In that stark reality, I found a semblance of peace. For now, survival took precedence. Tracking prey, seeking shelter, the urgency of these acts grounded me. Each beat of my heart became a declaration of life, however precarious. As darkness claimed the sky, I gazed up at the unfamiliar stars. My master had shown me their names, constellations born from myth and bloodshed. In their vast indifference, I felt my own insignificance, yet also a sliver of possibility. I was free, even if the cost of that freedom terrified me. One thing was certain. I would never walk the path my master had trod. Yet, the harsh world still had uses for the things he'd taught me. Ways to carve out a sliver of existence under the watchful eye of the night. Perhaps there was even a way to help those who, like me, got swept up in the world's secret currents. I drew my cloak tighter, a thin shield against the unknown. With every step into the deepening shadows, I vowed to find my own meaning, however uncertain or dangerous it might be. Days stretched into weeks, a rhythm dictated by sunrise and nightfall. I honed my skills, not as a predator, but as a scrapper, turning the forest's resources into crude tools and meager meals. Sleep became a catnap here and there, startled awake by the snap of a twig, haunted by the sense of lurking eyes in the gloom. Then a stroke of desperate luck. Not game, my tracking skills were still too rudimentary, but something just as invaluable. A hollowed-out log, remnants of a long-dead fire, and within, a small stash of traveller's supplies. Frayed rope, a rusted knife, tinderbox. Tools meant for another's journey, now repurposed for mine. The knife alone would have been treasure enough, but clutched among the weathered possessions, my fingers closed on a scrap of parchment. Moonlight was my lamp as I struggled to decipher clumsy yet legible writing. Not my master's elegant script, heavy with secrets. This was the scratchy hand of someone unaccustomed to learning, yet eager to preserve something. I strained to pass the words, and a chill unrelated to the night air settled into my bones. Werewolf, bane to village, beast of blood moon, silver. There was more, but my mind fixated on those stark phrases, folk tales and legends. Yet there was a rawness to the writing, the plea of someone desperately grasping for salvation. My master would have scoffed at such superstition. But what if that fear wasn't rooted in mere ignorance? The villagers saw me as tainted, perhaps with good reason. If those tales weren't just fear-born phantoms, was there truly something monstrous out here, beyond even the darkness I'd known? I returned to the stash, searching with renewed desperation. Among the worn clothes, I found several sprigs of an herb I didn't recognize. The parchment mentioned it. Wolfsbane. Protection, or maybe more. This was something tangible, not a path back to my old life. Even I wasn't naive enough to desire that. But perhaps a sliver of purpose within the wild existence I'd been thrust into. For the first time, that gnawing fear transformed into something potent, anticipation mixed with an icy determination. If these whispers of werewolves were true, they wouldn't be anything like the feral shadows I'd faced in the clearing. My master never showed me how to combat such creatures. No matter. If they threatened others, my path shifted not as an apprentice serving dark intentions, but perhaps as something else. Not yet a protector, for what power truly resided in a runaway who could barely feed himself? But the seed was planted. Dawn painted the eastern sky in streaks of grey and blood red. That night, when the moon began its ascent, I wouldn't hide. 
Armed with scavenged silver and that strange, half-understood knowledge, I ventured forth. This time, I became the hunter, though an ignorant one with more determination than skill. For beneath the terror, an undeniable thrill ignited in my blood. Was this what it felt like to truly make a choice? Not my master's manipulations, but my own perilous act of will. It made me feel something close to alive. Tracking under the fat moon proved disorienting. Shadows shifted, warped. An unfamiliar paranoia seeped into me. Were those eyes gleaming back at me from the underbrush merely those of startled hairs? Or was something truly stalking me, unseen and waiting for the perfect moment? Every rustle in the leaves made me grip the rusted knife tighter, the silver coins I'd salvaged from the stash cold and heavy in my pocket. Wolfsbane. The parchment was vague. Some shield, maybe a poison. If a creature like those legends truly existed, this would be about as reliable as tossing pebbles at a charging bear. Even in this desperate attempt at heroism, I hadn't escaped the legacy of my master's grim pragmatism. Movement flashed near a stand of skeletal trees. I crouched, waiting for that familiar primal dread that usually accompanied monstrous presences. Instead, a pang of sympathy passed through me. It was a wolf, but gaunt and mangy, less the majestic hunters of old tales, more a desperate scavenger. As it limped toward me, I realized something was horribly wrong. It wasn't attacking, it was whimpering, eyes fixed on me with chilling familiarity. Not hunger, but pleading. Its haunches twitched in aborted movements, like a puppet with fraying strings. Then came the smell, rot, and beneath it, something familiar, metallic and cold. An echo of that unnatural darkness my master wielded. I stepped closer driven by a morbid curiosity mingled with the stubborn refusal to simply become another piece of carrion. Its fur was matted, revealing what wasn't an injury but change. The flesh warped, bone shifted, a tortured canine growl ripped from its throat. Then something within snapped. In the space of a breath, where an animal stood, was a hulking, misshapen mockery of man and beast. This was no werewolf of whispered legend. This was contamination, a perversion of both natural order and my master's cruel experiments. My stomach churned as recognition settled like a stone. Whatever that creature in the forest clearing had been, a fragment of its essence lingered here, twisting something innocent into this. Rage flooded me hot and sharp, not mere revulsion but defiance. My master had tainted both this creature and me, it deserved mercy I no longer knew if I truly did. Yet, it wasn't my life the beast thirsted for. The wolf Spain. With trembling hands I crushed the bitter leaves. There wouldn't be enough to kill, or for whatever twisted spell of immunity those stones contained. It was nothing more than a gamble. On instinct. And dumb hope. It would have to do. The beast lunged less like predator than wounded animal driven by mindless torment. I didn't retreat. Instead, I hurled the crushed herbs directly into its gaping maw. It sputtered and retched, a sound so pained it echoed the man dying in the cottage, whose soul echoed now in the stones at my hip. Then something within the beast seemed to shudder, as if the corrupting power stumbled. With shocking clarity, its eyes seemed almost... lost, bewildered, I seized that moment. The knife wouldn't kill it, but silver cut deep all the same. It roared, swiping a clawed hand, and I barely danced from its reach. Blood slicked my arm, my own fear spiking again in tandem with adrenaline. This wouldn't last. Then, in that terrible flash of awareness within the beast, I saw an opening. Its thrashing was too wild, its balance faltering as the wolfsbane and pain took their toll. I surged forward, not at its throat, but the gnarled hand now clutching its side. My master's lessons in anatomy hadn't been wasted. It wouldn't last long, but just long enough for it to stumble, its own unnatural weight working against it. It tripped, crashed into the rough trunk of a tree, 
and I lunged. The silver coins weren't much, but held against the festering taint of corruption in its wound, it howled like a tortured demon. And as it thrashed, the unnaturalness ebbed from its features. The man and the beast became distinct, both suffering, but one no longer enslaved. Finally, its strength left it. In its eyes, no longer a beast's frenzy, but a broken human terror, I saw my own reflection. I collapsed beside the man, my injured arm screaming as forgotten pain erupted. He gasped, ragged breaths barely stirring the bloody leaves at his feet. The wolfsbane and silver had shocked his system, temporarily overriding the corruption. It wouldn't last long enough for mercy or explanation. Neither of us had either energy or will for much beyond simple survival. Survival felt as impossible as finding salvation under my master's cruel tutelage. But as I tore strips from my ragged clothing to crudely bandage my own wound, then do the same for those savage gashes on the man, there was a grim satisfaction. Survival in its purest form, devoid of grand purpose or the power plays of the soul collector. This wasn't redemption. I still walked a line blurred by darkness, but it was something I'd chosen, and that made all the difference. By the time dawn's cold glow crept over the horizon, the unnatural sheen that marked the corruption had entirely receded from the man's body. The wounds remained, ragged and terrible, but he now bore the marks of an unfortunate beast's attack, rather than something far more monstrous. He weakly opened his eyes, their confusion more human than wolfish. The silver had dulled his senses, and with the immediate threat abated, the shock of waking in this battered state would muddle his thoughts further. That was all the advantage I had. Don't try to move, I said, my voice hoarse. You were bitten by something tainted. Those herbs and the silver helped. The man grunted, a strangled sound that might have been disbelief, maybe a question. I had no words to ease his terror. In a few fleeting minutes, as strength seeped back into him, he'd realize everything I didn't want him to understand. My presence in this godforsaken corner of the forest, the reeking remnants of an unholy taint and the unsettling knowledge in my eyes. His best hope lay in convincing himself I was simply an odd but skilled healer and hoping I never showed him the stones at my hip. Those would reveal the full truth, that he'd just brushed against the darkness I could never quite leave behind. Finally, he managed a strangled cry. My village. Warn them. A jolt of panic, not for my own safety, but that of innocence. Where? I swallowed down the sudden dryness in my throat. What's the name of your village? Oakbridge. He coughed, then winced in pain. North by the river. Even I'd heard hushed whispers of Oakbridge, stories of a secluded folk clinging to old customs. That isolation kept them safe. Until now. But with this man as a carrier, even their distance might not be enough. A grim duty clawed at me. It wouldn't be the redemption I craved, but there could be prevention. Rest, I commanded, forcing my voice as steady as I could. The stones in my pocket weighed heavier than a sack of stones. If my master and his kind still thrived, they'd know what to do. And if anyone in this wide, heartless world deserved the touch of that icy darkness, it was them, not these simple villagers. With a last glance at the injured man, confusion still heavy in his eyes, I fled back through the dappled light and swirling shadows of the ever uncertain dawn. It wouldn't feel like my fight in the truest sense, but damn it, I wasn't about to stand aside and watch darkness devour lives my master never valued. This wasn't a chosen path, perhaps not ever mine to pick, but I carried the scars, the grim burdens of my time as the apprentice. Maybe the stones in my pocket held the seed of something far worse, but they held knowledge too, and this time... I swore they'd serve in protection, not damnation. The return journey seemed both a lifetime and a frantic blur. 
With each step towards Oakbridge, dread knotted tighter in my gut. For all my determination, every rustle of leaves and movement of shadow made me half expect to see my master's cold figure waiting amongst the trees. His absence echoed louder than any threat a corrupted woodsman or snarling wolf could conjure. Each stone at my hip hummed in unsettling harmony with the task ahead. My master had instilled disgust for common folk, painting them as cattle whose souls hardly fueled his terrible hunger. It was a lie, and this was all the proof I needed. Those souls held simple hopes and fears, as bright in their own way as the orbs he hoarded. Oakbridge might not hold heroes, but they didn't deserve the horror my master unleashed on the world. Yet, even in this desperate act, there was no true cleansing. Every strategy that formed in my mind relied on knowledge born in shadow. I'd be playing by his rules, but inverting them. The apprentice defying his master's intent. I stumbled into Oakbridge as dusk turned the thatched roofs a sullen bronze. Villagers eyed me, wariness and suspicion mirroring what I'd always seen in town. I approached one of the elders, a gnarled woman with eyes as keen as a hunting hawk. Keeping my voice level, I explained the danger. The attack, the taint, and the possibility it now lurked here. Waiting. Disbelief warred with mounting terror in her gaze. They might be isolated, but not untouched by rumours of the horrors haunting the land beyond their borders. After hushed consultations, she agreed to lead me to an empty cottage. They needed proof. The victim I claimed to have fought off. It was a risk. The man might even have reached Oakbridge on his own by now, his condition sowing more chaos than I could quell. But when we returned to the forest, it was chillingly empty. My heart felt heavier with each empty clearing we passed. Had he died out there alone, consumed by the beast within? Or worse, had the corruption regained control, turning him into a ravenous predator on the hunt for his own kin? That night in the isolated cottage, sleep never claimed me. I worked by candlelight, the stones thrumming against my palm as I studied their intricate etchings. My master always dismissed them as mere vessels, detritus in his pursuit of souls. But there was power here, ancient and primal, bound by whatever twisted rituals created these artifacts. I traced the sigils, barely comprehending their purpose, yet certain they were crucial. A crash shattered the fragile silence. It came from within the cottage itself. With the rusty knife drawn, I crept towards the bedroom. My sanctuary now felt a fragile trap. My breath tightened as my eyes pierced the shadows. Not a corrupted man-beast, but a different sort of monster. Fear. Villagers had gathered outside, their faces twisted in superstitious outrage. And leading them, with righteousness burning in his eyes, was the zealous priest from the village I despised. Demon touched! He roared, spittle foaming on his lips. I felt the evil the moment this one set foot in Oak Bridge! He brandished his iron amulet, the same trinket that had made my master sneer and disappear into the night so many times. We'll burn the darkness out of you, heretic. The mob pressed in, a tide of desperation and ignorance ready to swallow me whole. In that moment, I felt the echo of my master's cold logic. These fools believed their trinkets and prayers would protect them from a threat they only now grasped the magnitude of. It was folly. All their faith meant nothing against the true darkness I could unleash to save them but the taste of that despair I held at bay was just as bitter as my master's cold cruelty. They surrounded me, fear contorting their faces into parodies of piety. In the flicking candlelight, the priest's amulet hung suspended like an angry star. Every instinct screamed for me to lash out, to unleash the power thrumming through the stones. They wouldn't stand a chance, but neither would their fragile village under the onslaught it would attract. Then, it struck me. In their superstitious zeal, they were blind to what I understood with chilling clarity. Their faith was as flimsy a barrier against the true darkness as Wolfsbane against a rabid bear. 
This, ironically, provided an opening. Slowly I raised my hand, palm held upwards towards the priest. Stop, I rasped out, playing the part of the cowering heretic. Then, with a flash of movement no ordinary man could have mirrored, I grasped one of the stones from my pouch and held it aloft. In the sudden hush it moved, not with the serene glow of a captured soul, but with a hungry, shifting darkness. You feel it, don't you? My voice was barely above a harsh whisper. This, this is no trick of the devil, father. This is what comes for us all if we aren't vigilant. Their gazes fixated on the stone. Murmurs swept through the crowd, fear now mixed with nauseated awe. He speaks the truth, the elder woman who'd sheltered me said, her voice shaking slightly. This isn't, this isn't the work of Satan. My heart beat a ragged march in my chest. Their terror was as useful a tool as the priest's iron cross, both born of ignorance. That which made the man-wolf in the forest. It came from somewhere, I stressed. Someone knows their secrets, calls them out of the shadows, and I know how to find that source. A desperate gamble, but there was just enough truth laced in my words to ensnare them. The priest's certainty wavered replaced by something cold and calculating. It wasn't piety that filled his eyes now, but an opportunistic glint I recognized too well. He didn't care about defeating evil, but about wielding whatever tool lay at hand to tighten his grip on the hearts of these people. If you can lead us to this evil, he drawled, and cleanse it with righteous fire, there might yet be salvation for you. He was playing both sides, positioning himself as the leader, whether against the threat itself or the scapegoat in their midst. It disgusted me, but it also provided time. First, I forced out, playing the desperate convert. You need to see it, truly understand. I lowered the stone, then swiftly pressed it into the elder woman's hand. Her gasp echoed through the thatched cottage. Eyes widening, she stared at the object I'd thrust upon her. The stone hummed in her grasp, not a gentle purr, but a ravenous growl. Then on her palm, like a spider weaving its dark web, thin lines began to etch themselves, mimicking the sigils carved on the stone. Screams of terror filled the room. Villagers huddled away from her as if fearing the taint would leap out. And they were right to fear, but for reasons none of them truly understood. It was the perfect, terrible stage to play my next card. This, this is a beacon! I said, keeping my voice tight with urgency. When its master feels its resonance, he'll seek it out. And we'll destroy him! The priest roared, finding his footing back in familiar demagoguery. By axe and torch! We'll bring his damnation to him! And like that, in a single night, fueled by fear and desperation, the seeds of what I couldn't do alone were sown. Oakbridge transformed under the twin banners of faith and terror. Days that once moved to the rhythms of harvest and prayer became frenzied. Weapons were forged. Grim lessons in combat replaced tales by the fireside. Yet, even amidst their righteous zeal, fear gnawed at them. Fear of the unseen enemy and wariness towards me, the vessel of that monstrous truth. The elder woman marked by the echoing taint of the stone, was their unwilling martyr. Under the dubious care of the priest, she was both oracle and prisoner. Nightly, in a torch-lit ritual that chilled even my shadowed soul, they forced her to hold the stone. And nightly, its thrumming intensified. Proof their twisted logic proclaimed that the soul collector was drawn closer. Meanwhile, I became their reluctant tactician. Each dawn, armed with scraps of scavenged parchment, I outlined strategies based on the fragments of my master's knowledge I could stomach revealing. Ambushes. Snares. Using the natural boundaries of field and river as fortifications. Their initial faith in my words waned with each empty day. Every sunrise when the monstrous horde they anticipated failed to appear. In the darkest watches of the night, doubts coiled within me. Had I miscalculated, 
Was I simply delaying the inevitable, their inevitable deaths bought with false hope? In such moments, a tempting coldness seeped in. One flick of the wrist, the stones singing their deathly tune, and I could leave this fragile charade behind. Then I'd think of that spark of human defiance in the old man's dying eyes. The terrified man thrashing against corruption in the forest. Even the villagers, in their misguided wrath, deserved a fighting chance. One night, the change came. It wasn't an invading host, but a subtler shift felt only by the elder woman and me. Her gasps sent me rushing to her chamber, the priest close on my heels. In the torchlight, her markings seemed to bleed, twisting like living shadows. The stone vibrated in her grip, no longer a hunter's call, but a desperate, frenzied cry. They come, I murmured, not an army, but something colder, darker. In a move surprising even myself, I reached out, grasping her trembling hand. Not with my master's chilling touch, but a simple human grip. For a fleeting moment, I felt what she felt. A vast, empty hunger swirling like a dark tide, and at its heart, a malevolent focus fixed solely on its echoing beacon. He sees. The elder woman breathed, then slumped. My master wouldn't waste time on grand demonstrations of dominance. His first strike would be swift, meant to shatter morale and snatch whatever he truly sought. The villagers' simple tactics meant nothing in the face of this. It was time to unveil another ugly truth. I turned to the priest, his eyes alight with fear masked as pious resolve. This isn't a mere servant of darkness you've summoned, I rasped out, but it's master. Your trinkets won't save you now. I let them soak in the horror, then pressed on. But not all is lost. At his questioning look, I withdrew the remaining stones. This final gamble would decide everything. My master, he collects things. These draw on a similar power, the echo of those he consumes. To what end? The priest snapped, desperation clawing at his veneer of control. They're bait, I declared, revealing the final piece of my terrible plan. He'll follow his beacon, but with these around, confusion, it'll buy us time. They hesitated, seeing the glimmer of something so horrifying, fighting monstrousness with more monstrousness, that it outweighed even their impending doom. But when dawn painted the horizon blood red, they had no other choice. Later that day, under my direction, the stones lay half buried throughout the village, their hungry hum masked just enough to keep the beacon stone foremost in my master's unnatural senses. Then, we retreated to our pre-designated positions, my heart in my throat. We transformed from hunters to the hunted, a grim inversion that made my stomach churn. The villagers had their courage, honed by desperation. All I had were fragments of dark knowledge and an even darker hope. Waiting was more brutal than any physical battle. Each false alarm, a snapping branch, the cry of a startled bird, sent shockwaves through me. As twilight bled into night, the forest surrounding Oakbridge morphed from familiar wood into a grotesque looming presence. No monstrous horde materialized, yet the air thrummed with a predatory awareness. My master was here somewhere, circling like a vulture drawn by the promise of fresh carrion. As planned, the beacon stone remained in the cottage of the elder woman, shielded by the priest and his most devout warriors. Their piety couldn't harm my master, but perhaps it would make him underestimate them. My hope resided not in their prayers, but in the echoing power of the scattered stones, creating a web of confusion as their tainted energy clashed with the lure of the beacon. Each time, I expected him to emerge from the tree line, teeth bared in wrath. Only the nightmarish silence met me. Was my gamble failing? Or was I merely the fly, unaware of the moment the spider decided to descend? Then, it happened. No dramatic descent from the heavens, no monstrous army tearing through the forest. Simply the steady scream of the beacon stone in the cottage and through the trees a ripple of something that wasn't light or shadow, but a wrongness that made my very bones prickle. 
His presence entered Oakbridge from the riverbank, moving along its shadowed currents with unnatural swiftness. No, not swiftness. Certainty. This wasn't a scout testing defences, but the lord of a grim domain coming to claim what he perceived as his. Arrogance was one of my master's most potent weaknesses, and the one I pinned my last desperate hopes on. Crouched upon a rooftop, invisible among the dark thatch, I witnessed what the villagers could not. His form, cloaked in that unnerving nothingness, barely disturbed the moonlit water as he reached the centre of the village, unhurried. Each step echoed through the unnatural silence he carried with him, and I realised why no attack had come. He didn't need an army. His presence was the onslaught. A scream echoed out, one of the guards at the cottage. I held my breath. Had they fallen so swiftly? My heart hammered a panicked rhythm as my master flowed towards the stone's cry. Then something impossible happened. Just as he was about to breach the threshold, he hesitated. That chilling stillness descended again, heavier now with a fleeting hint of confusion. Then from another direction a faint echo thrummed, one of the other stones, partially shielded yet potent enough to snag his attention. An almost inaudible hiss broke the night's quietude. My master's frustration became visible. No grand gesture, but a shift in his posture, a slight tilt of that cloaked form that spoke volumes. Then, with disturbing fluidity, he altered course, heading not for the cottage and its prize, but out into the shadowed fields where my scattered trap awaited. A surge of relief coursed through me, laced with an almost giddy dread. It was working. Not perfect, he still sought the prize, but with his focus splintered, perhaps. Just perhaps, they had a chance. The villagers who cowered, who prayed with desperate conviction, who charged in blind bravado, they might yet stand against him. They, without knowledge of his true terror, wielded their human desperation like a blazing sun to a creature born of shadow. My part was almost done. Now it was their fight for survival, and maybe, just maybe, a seed of defiance planted against the Soul Collector's reign was beginning to sprout. It wasn't salvation, not in the purest sense, but it was enough. From my hidden vantage point, I witnessed the unfolding chaos. It wasn't a battle as men of war know it, rather a desperate dance against the unnatural. Shadows moved where there should be none, moonlight revealing glimpses of that terrifying void before my master vanished again. Cries echoed, panicked, pained, but amidst them, a stubborn ring of steel on steel. His arrogance did not prepare him for the blind determination of those cornered. With each echoing beat of his stolen power, the stones he collected surged in response. The beacon drew him forth, but at every crossroads an echo of that stolen energy flared, confusing, redirecting. These lures weren't meant to slay the predator, but to buy time, and damn me, they were succeeding. I thought to laugh, then, with a chill, heard an echo of my master's cold mirth when he played such games himself. Perhaps even those in the heart of darkness could learn to adapt to the tactics of hunted prey. Then it came. Not a roar of outrage, but a hiss that seemed to pierce the very night. From my rooftop I saw it. A sliver of my master's true form, clawing through the veil of his practiced invisibility. The sight wasn't the grotesque creature my mind had conjured, but something colder, simpler. Darkness made physical, an emptiness gnawing at the edges of life itself. And for a heartbeat, his unearthly eyes fixed on me, not in recognition, but in simple, predatory focus. My blood turned to ice. That was when I knew. This hadn't been about just claiming his stolen prizes. This was a message delivered directly to the runaway apprentice. No words needed, just the chilling promise of a hunt when this distraction was dealt with. Acting not on thought, but raw survival instinct, I scrambled off the roof. Each crash of splintering wood sounded like a thunderclap announcing my presence. Across the darkened fields, the beacon throbbed with frantic urgency, 
And still those echoes drew him away, frustrating the creature whose focus should have been absolute. It was a testament to the simple, blinding fury of those defending their homes that even a fragment of such monstrous attention could be diverted. As I stumbled past shadowed barns and terrified livestock, something cracked like dry branches deep in the woods. One by one, the echoing stones fell silent, snuffed out as my master tracked their false allure. Only the village centre throbbed with a furious intensity now, as he finally zeroed in on the true prize. I didn't dare look back. I fled, not out of cowardice, but from the certainty that to return would undo anything my desperate gambit had bought them. When I finally broke the tree line, a sliver of dawn bled red. Smoke wisped from the village, but with a grim relief I heard shouts, some cries of pain but more still defiant. In the faint light, what I could make out wasn't a scene of ruin, but one of grim persistence. Oakbridge may have borne terrible scars, but it did not lie conquered. Knowing the price on my own head, I vanished into the vastness beyond their borders. In the heart of that bleak wilderness, I found a hollowed tree, and within stashed what remained of my meagre possessions. Not the stones, no, never those, but the salvaged parchment, the worn cloak. There, on a scrap, I traced what crude map's memory allowed, marking Oakbridge as best I could, and what lay beyond, those twisted paths my master commanded. My knowledge might be damned, but it was all I had to offer the world. An atlas of darkness, should those with purer hearts than mine wish to chart a course to its heart. For even in the face of such inhuman power, a desperate light refused to die out. I had to believe that someday it might blaze brightly enough to burn the shadows away.